Welcome to The Two Testaments, a guided journey through Scripture with leading experts on the Bible, hosted by Ronnie Cosman and Will Kynes. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts or at thetwotestaments.com. Follow us on Twitter at the number two testaments or ask questions in our Facebook group. Welcome to the Two Testaments podcast, a guided journey through scripture. I'm Will Kynes. And I'm Ronnie Cosman. And in this episode, we're looking at Romans 5 to 6. Today, we're talking to Dr. Beverly Gaventa. Dr. Beverly Gaventa is Distinguished Professor of New Testament at Baylor University. She's the author of a number of important works on Paul, including a commentary on First and Second Thessalonians. She's also the author of Our Mother, St. Paul, and most recently, When in Romans, An Invitation to Linger with the Gospel According to Paul. And let me just say... That is one of my favorite titles in biblical <laughs> scholarship. I remember when I first thought it, heard, first heard it, and I thought, that is genius. But when in Romans, did you come up with that, Beverly, or is that the publisher? It was actually a title I used for a series of lectures I gave. And the truth is that somebody suggested it to me. I was with a group of people that I actually didn't know, and I was sort of brainstorming. And someone spoke up and said, when in Romans, and it, I didn't pay much attention. And then later on, the more I thought about it, the better I liked it. The problem with that is that I have not been able to go back and properly thank that individual. Okay, so maybe if that person is listening, they can contact uh, Beverly and let, let her know so that she can express her thanks for that genius <laughs> title for the book. Now, Beverly, when I was um, on the quest to find a PhD program, um, I asked Stephen Westerholm, who is my uh, thesis advisor at McMaster, I asked him, who, who would you study with? And he gave two names. I won't reveal the second one. But one of the names he said was Beverly Gaventa, okay. that if he was going to do a PhD, he would study with Beverly Gaventa. Right. And, you know, I, I have great admiration for Stephen Westerholm. Right. And so for him, when he said that, I thought, wow, Beverly Gaventa, but I got to have her on the podcast. Yes. Thinking back, you, know? but you just couldn't imagine leaving Canada at that yes. point in your life. Oh, well, that's right. Well, that's I, right. I, well, I, I am <laughs> actually quite moved by that uh, anecdote, Ronnie, because I have great admiration for Steve, too. So thank you for that. Mm. Yeah, that's yeah. fantastic. Now, Beverly, what first dro uh, drove you, inspired you to start studying Romans? That actually goes back all the way, I won't say quite how many years, to my uh, first year in seminary. Um, I was not actually interested in New Testament at all. I had had some pretty bad classes as an undergraduate, right. and uh, I was trying to um, deal with a requirement that I take some New Testament classes, and so I stumbled into an exegesis class on Romans taught by J. Lewis Martin, and that was the beginning, you know, and that was, that was the end. <laughs> um, part of it for me was the sheer puzzle of it, the, the uh -huh. following Paul's logic and trying to understand how one thing was connected to another. The other, I think, was this glimpse of uh, what Paul is saying to us about God's relationship to us and how uh, generous, how capacious that is. And I, I've been drawn to that ever since. Uh, Beverly, what for you is the most difficult thing to understand about these two chapters, Romans 5 to 6? The most difficult thing about these chapters, especially the second half of chapter 5, I think, is the repetition. Hmm. If you, I'm working on a commentary on Romans, and if you are working through uh, the second half of chapter 5, where he does that prolonged contrast between mm -hmm. Adam and Christ, then what strikes you is the repetition of it. It's as if you're reading Hebrews and he keeps saying the same thing over and over. And you have to struggle with why. What is it that makes this so important? Mm -hmm. I think it's also a little bit difficult to get a handle on why he feels it's necessary to say any of the things that are in these chapters. Back in chapter three, which many people think is the highlight of the letter, you know, the, the core of the letter, 
in chapter three, where he talks about the death of Jesus and God putting Jesus forward as the mercy seat and as the way of making things right between God and humans, you think he has dealt with this problem of sin. But then in chapter five, he's talking about it again, and even in a more prolonged way. So wrestling with those two texts in relationship to one another is, for me, the most difficult question. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned your initial interest in Romans came out of seeing it as a kind of puzzle. So how does this piece here in Romans 5 and 6 fit into the larger puzzle of Romans in your view? In, in my view, and everything I will say is, you know, represents my own work, um, uh, enlightened by a, a myriad of predecessors in the study of Romans. But I think in Romans 5, Paul is actually fleshing out what he's already said in chapter 3. Many commentaries and uh, studies of the Bible will say that in chapters 5 through 8, Paul is talking about the Christian life. You know, he's talked about sin in 1 to 4. Now he's talking about the Christian life. And um, I'm not sure it works that well. Uh, it does for about the first three or four verses of chapter five. But in chapter five, he takes us back into the problem of sin. And I think in chapters five and six, what he does is to extend what he's already said. Mm -hmm. And he radicalizes it, if you will. The problem is not just that I have sinned or that you have sinned. Uh, the problem is not one of just Abraham, chapter four. The problem is about the whole of humanity mm -hmm. and how the whole of humanity is captive, the language he uses, to forces of sin and death and has to be redeemed, mm -hmm. has to be rescued from the forces of sin and death. So I think in chapters five and six, we start to see just how large Paul's gospel is, how capacious it is. Now, you know, I always have a difficult time when I come to these chapters with verses 1 through 11, with how do those verses fit in to what comes after in verses 12 through 20. Uh, so let's begin with verse 1, Beverly. Paul right. says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes on in verses 9 to 12 to talk about how we have been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. What does Paul mean when he says we have peace? Is Paul talking about an internal spiritual peace or is this peace in a different way? I think when Paul talks about peace here, it certainly doesn't preclude an internal sense of wellness. At least I hope it doesn't. But I think this piece here presupposes that God, God and humanity have actually been at odds. You know, one of the things we skip over is down in verse 10, where he says, we were enemies of God. You know, this is language that suggests we were on the side of sin, on the side of death, on the side of forces of evil. And we have been delivered from that. And now we have been reconciled. We have peace with God. Um, and that is what enables us finally to, um, uh, to live into a Christian life. So is it picking up on a kind of battle imagery? Is that with the enemies and so. being reconciled? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. There's a, a fair amount of conflict language throughout this section of Romans, even extending into chapters seven and eight. Sometimes you can't see it in the Greek, in the English translations. But when Paul says over in chapter six, you know, present your body parts as um, weapons, you know, the English usually says instruments of righteousness, uh, or you were instruments of wrong. Now you should be instruments of righteousness. That's language for uh, for weaponry. Mm -hmm. Later on, when he says, 
uh, the wages of sin is death. That's a very particular term that is used in uh, military texts for the pay that you get for being a soldier. So mm. this is pretty agonistic language. Mm. Interesting. And that, I mean, I think that really helps us integrate versus helps me integrate verses one to 11 into what we see in verses 12 through 20. Um, so let's move there. Paul tells us okay. in verses 12 through 20, how sin and death entered the world. And he takes us all the way back to the first human to Adam. He says, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all people because all sin. How does Paul present uh, sin and death to us? And there are other characters at play here in chapters five and six. I think I've already anticipated the way I would answer that question. A number of scholars will say Paul is simply personifying sin and death here. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's very hard to tell, right, when somebody is simply personifying or when they really mean these are forces, these are powers in some sense. And I think for Paul, these are real. Whether you say whatever kind of language we ascribe to it. So what he's what he means is sin and death. You know, Adam's act opened the door for sin and death to come in. And I think this is by way of explaining uh to the Romans, recalling for the Romans what their situation was. Could you elaborate on that a little bit in terms of what it means to say that sin and death are real? So they're not just yeah. constructs in our yeah. heads, but they have a, a reality. Right. How's Paul thinking about that? Well, a, another way of saying that would be sin and death are not for Paul simply events. They're not simply something that I do or you do or we do, but they, that those actions, which he has detailed back in chapters one to three, are symptoms of a, uh, um, of a power itself. And that's the kind of language he uses when sin, uh, sin enters the world, death enters the world. Uh, sin and death rule, uh, sin and death uh, multiply, verse 20, sin multiplies. You know, you have this sense of sin as being uh, almost cancerous in the way it has taken on a life of its own here. Yeah, the picture in verse 14, yet death exercised dominion or ruled, right? right? That picture of sin and death as rulers is really not just, this is not just something you do, right? As you mentioned earlier, this is right. uh, sin and death are, are rulers and powers that take hold of you. They, yeah. they, they overpower the world and many, and was what Paul was getting at, I think. Yeah, and I, I think this is why Paul almost never uses the language of repentance or forgiveness. Because although uh, I can repent of an act, I can't repent my way out of this situation. I have to be, we collectively, humanity has to be taken out of the situation. Again, it goes back to this notion of conflict. Right. Yeah, that does, that does draw that out in a powerful way. Yeah. You've already alluded to this extended contrast that Paul creates here between Adam and Christ. So verse 15, for example, in chapter five, but the free gift is not like the trespass for if the many died through the one man's trespass, that's Adam, much more surely have the grace of God and the free gift in the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, bounded for the many. Or then in verse 19, for just as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. So what is Paul's purpose here in this repeated and, as you pointed out, extended contrast between Adam and Christ? I think his purpose here is to show that just as what Adam did affected all of humanity, right? nobody escaped. What Christ has done also affects the whole of humanity. Otherwise, 
this contrast doesn't work. It falls apart for him. Now, he says the many, right? Uh, in, in some other places in here, he also says all, although I'm not. Oh, yes. Verse 18, uh, he uses all. Right. One I'll of just the read things that. that I, Verse 18, yeah. therefore, just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all. So there we've got all contrast in, instead of many. Right. And I think the reason uh, we get hung up, or some people do, on the many is that, in, is that, again, we can't see the Greek. In the Greek, as you know, it's hoi polloi. So you get, there's a lot of alliteration in this passage. And poloi is an alternate for him to Pontus, mm -hmm. at least here. I don't think he really distinguishes between them. I think poloi is simply, it just sounds good because he's got paroptoma, uh, paroptomati, hoi poloi, a pethanon. You know, you can hear mm -hmm. all of those yeah. uh, P sounds, even if you don't know any Greek. Right, that's true. But does the does the contrast work? Is is there some fudging going on here between the all and the many? Because many would see Paul arguing that all are condemned in Adam, but then does that mean, based on the logic of the comparison, that all are therefore saved in Christ? Does that point us towards a kind of universalistic view? I want to borrow from Carl what I understand to be Karl Barth's position on this, which is that he would never say he himself was a universalist because that is to claim to know the mind of God. Right? Mm. And I am not going to claim that Paul was a universalist because I think that implies that Paul himself had access to the mind of God. <laughs> and uh, there are numerous places where he makes sure we know that that's not the case. But I do think the logic of his gospel is a gospel that does not exclude mm. anybody. And mm -hmm. I think um, Christians get quite hung up sometimes on trying to make sure somebody gets excluded uh, for, for fear that somebody will get something for free, you know. Well, the point is that all of us uh, who understand ourselves to be Christian are claimed um, for free, right? Uh, the gospel is free. That's exactly what grace means. So I don't, I don't myself find any problem with saying that for Paul, all actually means all, okay. eventually, eschatologically, okay. right? In, in the future that God brings about. I mean, I, I think also like the text itself, the, in Romans 5 verses 12 through 20, Paul's, let's say, vantage point or his canvas is cosmic. Right. It's, a, right. it's like he has the whole world in view, right? right. So I think uh, trying to pr maybe perhaps even trying to press him on the details of that particular theological question is going to run us into problems because his concern is what is the, let's say the global picture, right? Mm -hmm. First it was sin and death who came and they tyrannized the whole world. And now it's Jesus Christ and those who have received the gift, right? And eternal life who are now reigning over the world. So like oh, that's wow. his perspective right here. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, my take is that I don't want to press him too much on the on the details on, on this passage. If right. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it might be helpful to step back just a little bit. And a lot of what we've been talking about so far in terms of this kind of battle imagery and that cosmic idea, dominion of sin. This is all pointing us toward a kind of apocalyptic understanding mm -hmm. of Paul's theology. Would you like to briefly give our <laughs> listeners a <laughs> um, uh, a, an insight into what that means to say that Paul has an apocalyptic theology here. Right. Well, the first thing I should say about that is it doesn't mean it's a horror movie, right? <laughs> um, but apocalyptic is not disaster. You know, apocalypse in Greek is an uncovering. Uh, it is a revelation, if you will. And when, when those of us who use this language to talk about Paul's theology as apocalyptic, when we use that term, what we're trying to get at, and it's a shorthand for a much larger notion, is that the gospel, that the event of the death and resurrection of Jesus 
comes as God's intrusive act in a world that is uh, ruled by sin and death, a a world that's gone its own way, if you will, and that God reclaims that world uh, in the person uh, and the work of Jesus. So it is an apocalypse in that sense. It, there's not a kind of nice, tidy line across history in which Jesus is kind of uh, the best new teacher on the block. You know, Jesus is not a, a new, improved David. Uh, Jesus is an intervention in a world that is uh, a disaster. Beverly, in 520, Paul says something also puzzling (laughs) the law was brought in so that the trespass might increase now this feels like marcionite territory yeah the uh the early christian who thought that the law the old testament the god of the old testament was bad right this Mm -hmm. kind of sounds a little bit like that i mean what's paul saying here can can we uh, call paul a marcionite or can we absolve him of the charge well this is one of many many great places in which to reiterate that you can never take a single sentence out of context, right? That is more true about Paul's comments about the law than it is about most other things. You just can't take a single comment about the law and say, aha, especially in Romans, because Romans develops across at least seven chapters into what what Paul actually has to say about the law. And he drops in these statements that are incredibly negative, right? And at the same time, he will say uh, that the law uh, is there to instruct, right? He will say positive. He says he upholds the law. Then he turns around and says uh, the law uh, uh, increases sin. I think what he's doing is driving the auditor And remember, all of the first generations were listening to this text. They were not reading it. It drives the auditor to ask the question that's asked of chapter seven. Is the law sin? And logically, he has kind of argued that the law is and sin can really not be distinguished. But then in chapter seven, he says, no, the real problem is not the law. The problem is that sin has taken hold, even of the law. Mm -hmm. God's holy, right, and good law has been taken over by sin so that there is a kind of split in the law itself. And that, again, has to be redeemed uh, in in Jesus, in -hmm. the action of God in Jesus. So you could actually see this verse here pointing again to that dominion of sin. Sin is so powerful that even God's righteous law has been brought under its sway. Right. I mean, that that is the terrifying thing that is happening, I think, when you get to chapter seven, is you have this this picture of sin that is so out of control that it can invade even the territory God has made in the law. Wow. Okay. Let's move on to chapter six. And chapter six begins with Paul anticipating a potential objection from an interlocutor. So he says, what then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? Now, why has Paul come to the conclusion that his imaginary interlocutor would ask this question? And then how does he respond to this potential objection? Well, there are a lot of scholarly theories about why Paul says this. One option is that people actually do know uh, his letter to the Galatians with its pretty negative language about the law. And some people have associated him with failure to observe the law. And we see in the book of Acts that that is historically Uh, As Luke understands it, at least, that is a charge that may have been brought against him. I'm not so sure I want to uh, use that kind of historical reconstruction here. This is one of many places in the letter where he takes a kind of um, possible extrapolation of what he's just said 
and turns it into a way of making his positive argument. It's possible for someone to say, oh, grace is ruling now. I can do whatever I want to. Mm -hmm. And uh, instead, he says, no, uh, what this means is that we either live here. He becomes very uh, geographical. We either live in the place of sin or we have been moved into a place governed by the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. We live out of our baptism and our uh, union with him, as it were. Could you talk a little bit more about that baptism piece here? Because I don't know if most readers would expect that to be Paul's initial response to this objection. So verse three, do you not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus? Or sorry, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. How is baptism working here to respond to this objection? One of the things we have to remember when we're reading this passage is that it is among the earliest texts we have that reflect on baptism. Right? So it's a little hard to know where Paul is getting this interpretation. Uh, but it does seem clear that he already is taking baptism not simply as um a way of joining this community, but of actually sharing in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Although he's pretty careful not to say we we have been resurrected, we have new life. Uh, you know, he anticipates resurrection. I kind of think the uh, overreaction in Corinth may have made him just a little cautious here. But he, he, anal he analogizes baptism with death. We died you know, with Christ, and therefore we live a different life. And there's, there is this strong disjuncture that's being made there that goes back to the question of in whose life, in whose territory you reside. Right. I, I do think I'm, I'm overstating it a little bit, but I think the analogy of territory um, here becomes very useful, that you're either living in the territory of sin or you're living in the territory ruled by Christ, and you can't be in both places at once. Right. Mm -hmm. And that, that carries out of the battle language of chapter five, mm -hmm. because what are battles often about? Territory. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Who is going right. to be in control of right. this territory? So he moves right. from that battle in chapter five to these two different territories, and you would you say you have to choose which territory you're going to live or you have been brought into a new territory? You're like a, a you, well, I don't know how far we want to push this analogy, but like you've been a, a captured in the battle and brought over to another side. Well, you know, over in Philippians three, when he writes that sort of autobiographical pack passage, he says, I was overtaken. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think the language is pretty, uh, passive, you know, you were taken over uh, in, into baptism. I don't think there's a, a sort of choice being made here. What about, Beverly, the, the slavery language that we have in our, here in, the, in chapter 6? So he says, verse 15, what then should we sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. But that's the same char charge, the same right? Question, that he's repeating. Right. What then should we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient <clears throat> slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. And that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Well, how do you how does this slavery metaphor work? Because now he's going to almost put it to his audience and say, now you present yourselves as slaves to, uh, you know, to righteousness instead of to sin, which I mean, in terms of this apocalyptic way of thinking, 
is it now that you that you've been liberated you now have the agency to do that or what can you help us think through that a little bit i do think that there is a kind of uh, uh that two things are being said here you were freed from sin you have notice the passive you have in the greek you have become enslaved to righteousness so it's passive in both senses now uh Paul does not regard those as um, uh, as equivalent enslavements, you know, and and we have to say that this language of slavery is highly problematic, as it should be for us. I don't think Paul inhabited a world that was uh, full of freedom of choice. You know, I don't think Paul understood this whole episode, this whole uh, story about God's action to be a matter of choosing, but of something people have been chosen out of. You have become obedient after having been uh, released and having been enslaved again. Mm -hmm. It's interesting language in verse 16. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, so it seems like there's a tension here between the agency of presenting yourself, but then as an obedient slave, so you don't have agency. Can you help us think through those, how those fit together? (laughs) Yeah, uh, we might need Paul to help us with that. (laughs) Um, Certainly there is a kind of agency there, isn't there? I think it's an agency that is possible because of what's already been said in chapter five. In other Mm -hmm. words, it is now uh, possible to address a demand to this group. Here, uh, a number of people might recognize I am relying heavily on the work of J. Lewis Martin, one of my early teachers and a a great mentor to many of us. But I don't think that this is a choice that is made, say, back in Chapter 5 or even in the early part of Chapter 6. I think the choice is only possible, right? Mm -hmm. And Paul knows that that Christians are not sort of automatically um, um, made into obedient believers who do just what is right all the time. If he did, he wouldn't have needed to write the sections of his letters in which he offers instructions. Now, he he knows that we still live in the real in in this world. Right. Uh, But I think he believes that we are addressable by virtue of the gospel as people who belong to the body of Christ. uh, Then that relationship calls us into a certain kind of uh, choice, a certain kind of decision. You know, the other thing when I was reading this that struck me because of the uh, whole way of uh, talking about sin and death as powers, uh, which is a verse that you mentioned earlier, Beverly, in 623, Mm -hmm. for the wages of sin is death. I mean, I don't think I typically miss the imagery going on here. I, I think, Beverly, and let me know what you think of this, that the wage of sin, sin is still being um, presented as that enslaving power. Mm-hmm. Right. So sin and then what it pays you <laughs> yeah. is death. Right. right. If, so if you obligate yourself to obeying sin as your master, as your Lord, then the, what you will receive in return for that is death. And the contrast to that is now, I don't know how this works exactly, but maybe Jesus as the Lord. Right. If you're submitted to him, then the result is the gift of eternal life. Right. Um, right. Is that is and, that and, and, yeah, and interestingly, one of them is is a way that is one of them is earned and the other is given. Right. Yeah, right. Those are very different images. It's not that yeah. you you sort of pay your money and you take your choice, right? But your uh, your allegiance uh, produces certain things, and uh, one of them is the reward that you've earned, and the other is uh, never the reward that you've earned. <laughs> It's always a gift, right? It never ceases to be a gift. Yeah. 
Great. Well, thank you so much, Beverly, for taking us uh, through some time in Romans. So we've been in Romans for a little while with you, and we really appreciate your insight on these passages. We just have one more question for you, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, What we like to do at the end of our episodes is to ask the scholars that we have on to participate in that genre that biblical scholars seem to have perfected, which is the blurb, right? Recommending something. And it doesn't have to be a book. Uh, It could be a movie or a TV show or some kind of life hack that you picked up during the lockdowns or something that you think our listeners might appreciate. So do you have a blurb for us? My uh, blurb for the moment, uh, and I get no money from this endorsement, I want to say, (laughs) is uh, an app that I put on my computer that is called Freedom. And when you activate Freedom, you are cut off from the internet. So you cannot do email. You cannot go to Facebook. You cannot, uh, you can't do searches, which is something of a problem. But it means that when I want to write for an hour or an hour and a half, I put freedom on and it cuts me off. At least now you can get out of it, but I have to think about it. And it sends me back to my work. And I have really appreciated it. And it's appropriate because we were talking about, you know, freedom from sin. So we've got freedom from the dominion of the Internet. (laughs) That's right. The evil influence of the Internet. You do have to pay for it, but it's pretty reasonable for what you get. So that's great. Well, Beverly, thank you for uh, taking the time out of your schedule and sharing your expert guidance on Romans five to six. And, uh, To you listeners, thank you for joining us on this journey. Uh, If you'd like to know more, if you'd like to see more episodes, you can go to our website at thetwotestaments.com. You can also find our Facebook group and you can submit your questions. And we will take a stab. I hate using that metaphor. And we'll take an (laughs) attempt at uh, trying to answer and work through some of those questions on a QA and a episode. So thanks again. The Two Testaments is produced with the support of Sanford University, where Ronnie Cosman and Will Kynes are professors in the Department of Biblical and Religious Studies. Thanks to Joe Zellner, Jody McFarlane, and the team in the Faculty Success Center, and our student assistants, Carson Knopf, Jake Maddox, Harrison Pike, and Gracie Plum, for their help with production, editing, and promotion.